art in for you to live with, for you to experience and for you to grow with. Um, I'm only going to tease you with Ruo images tonight. They're going to be there when I hit the various topics. Um, but they're Next week, we'll deal with the show and the intent of seeing Christ in the darkness. But tonight, I want to uh, hit a few reasons art helps us to see scripture. Think about that. Helps us to see scripture. Um, it has been said that individuals may not need art, but civilizations do. And I believe that churches do. We need art that can last the test of time and speak to the very presence of God in our midst. This was done in the past for centuries. Even, even in the 20th century, we have some giants, one of which is Rouault. But So in the next few minutes, I would like to share with you some reasons that I believe art helps us to see scripture and to experience God in a more intimate way visually. And we're using the visual arts as a, a Lenten path. First, I would like to say that art teaches prayer and um, offers contemplation. I want to read to you a, a line from David Goa, who was the curator of one, uh, the only big show in North America at the turn of the century. It was called Anna Domini, Jesus Through the Centuries. And this was at the Provincial Museum in Edmonton, um, Canada. And uh, he spoke at that and at a SIVA conference and he said, art is liturgy, the holding of the world together, a glimpse of the present scene. Art and prayer open all the work of the Lord for our contemplation and lead us into the precincts of praise. Now, this last phrase is one I want you to remember. To teach us to pray, that is the work of art. To teach us to see, that is the work of prayer. Isn't that a beautiful uh, short summation? Um, so, Andrew, one sec, just let me interrupt you real quick. Sorry, I'm, I'm just having trouble with the slideshow real quick. Casey, are you letting people in? Because for some reason, I'm unable to do that. Okay. Um, I'm having trouble this, getting out of this, this piece thing. right here that you see is Ruo's and it's Lord, I can see you. Lord, it is you. The man is blind. Hmm. Sandra, oh, will I want to get your, your, uh, this the just say next when you want me to go to the next slide is that in the next one you can go to the next great okay um two art opens us to the spiritual art can be a vehicle of the deepest spiritual experience even conversion now some of you may recognize this is the saint francis cross do you recognize it but did you know that after a long journey, it is in front of this cross that St. Francis prostrated himself and gave himself to God. And as an artist, I'm particularly grateful to know that such an important piece of art was an instrument in somebody's conversion. In, in response to this cross and his experience, he wrote, all highest glorious God, cast your light into the darkness of my heart. Give me right faith, firm hope, perfect charity, and profound humility with wisdom and perception, O oh Lord, so that I may do what is your most perfect and holy will. Amen. Crosses, this is um, 12th century cross. You notice that Jesus is resurrected. When we begin in the 13th century, we begin to see him, them dealing with his death. But these Byzantine crosses were meant for contemplation and meditation. And from these crosses, I have done a whole series. I've spent... I guess it's almost 20 years working drawings from these. You can go to the next one now. Art offers us an educational opportunity. Um, the dictionary actually says that art is a way of knowing. Um, this is one of the reasons I collect art. 
every time I purchase a piece of artwork, I know, oh my gosh, there's a whole world that's going to open to me. I'm going to learn about this person. This Ruo exhibit offers you an opportunity um, to add a, another, voc uh, uh, another person to artist to your vocabulary of artists. And these artists that have struggled with faith in their art. Ruo was one of the most important artists of the 20th century. You know, at one point, he and uh, Picasso, he and Brock were the three most important artists. But because his work dealt with um, religious uh, uh, intent, uh, his interest in his work has certainly dwind dwindled. You know, as Father Zach has said, his work is not easy. Lent is not easy. So it's very appropriate that it's, the, it's in your church at this time of year. I have sent a few uh, copies of Bill Dernis's uh, wonderful essay that he wrote for this sh uh, show. Some of you should make sure you get it. And um, it has a fabulous essay. And Bill Dernis wrote a book in 1973 as his doctoral thesis that is still the um, most important document on Rouault's faith. Uh, so that's an important one if you're really interested in um, his art. And we'll have these, Sandra. Um, if you come see the show in person, you'll be able to pick up one of these, Yeah. Uh, which is the essay you mentioned. It's really worth reading. Okay, you can go to the next one. The visual allow, uh, arts allow us to uh, a place for the emotional, actually allow us to see us see with our hearts. Paul wrote in Ephesians, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Now, you may say, what is this picture? This is by Tim Lowley. It's called Tema on Earth. Um, you can't look at this without being emotionally stirred. Tema, at this point, was Tim's 13-year-old daughter who was multiply impaired, had never been able to do anything all, in, all her life. He paints, he spent his entire life painting her. Here she is, almost invisible on the face of the earth. What he's struggling with is, what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be made in the image of God? And he's saying, He's gripping with the, uh, the part of a hopeless child as Tim considers about his own daughter, the value of being apart from the capability of doing anything. Think about that. We say when somebody asks you, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? Well, to think, to be creative, to worship, to do all those things. Tema has never been able to do any of those things. Is she still human? Is she still made in the image of God? How profound uh, uh, an insight that he offers us. And this is a huge 16 foot painting. So you have to be bold over to see this. And I hope this, this is an image that imprints itself on your mind. And remember that um, in terms of asking important questions and thinking about things emotionally. The next image is a challenge by Reverend John Kiefer. Kiefer is a Catholic priest that I, uh, is in the Midwest. When I saw this uh, chalice, I was just blown away. And I thought, would he ever sell it? And he did, he sold it to me. I was so um, excited. Um, the name of this is, can you drink this cup? I am about to drink. Questions that Jesus asked. And it takes us by surprise as we contemplate its meaning. It brings into focus the sacrifice that in resting ways that um, don't, we don't usually contemplate. Can you imagine being handed this chalice on Good Friday? Um, this artist has made visible the invisible in very profound and graphic ways for us. You can go to the next one. Um, art can be used to teach deep spiritual truths and doctrine. 
I'm particularly interested in how uh, religious art can teach doctrine. This is Felipe's, uh, Philippe Lippi's Annunciation. This is in the National Gallery in London. And when I took my grandchildren to London, this was one of the pieces I wanted them to see up close. I believe the church is missing a great opportunity when it teaches theology without the aid of the visual arts. During Advent, um, uh, I gave a presentation to the church here in Hilton Head in about three or four Sundays called The Word Made Flesh. I told the congregation that this would be pure art history and pure theology, but that they would love it. And we visually explored the theology of the word made flesh through a series of images from, uh, from medieval to contemporary. One of these images was Filippo Lippi's Annunciation, um, which gives uh, insightful and powerful uh, and, uh, insights. Now, in an Annunciation, which I taught them, in an Annunciation piece, you have several elements that have to be there. You've got to have an angel. You've got to have Mary in a blue garment. There's always some lilies to uh, signify her um, purity. And there's usually a dove or something to signify the Holy Spirit. They're all there. The um, angel is to the left. He is looking at Mary and talking her to, to her to tell her that she is the cho chosen to be bearer of the incarnation. Mary sits dress dressed in her original, in her typical garment. Another device that artists, uh, artists have used. For it. How are they going to say she was this devout um, woman of faith? And uh, in medieval times, she's almost always kneeling or sitting at a desk and reading scripture. Notice the book in her hand. Um, but in this one, Leapy has God's hand at the top. Can you see it in the very top? And God's hand is uh, giving her a blessing, the two fingers that, uh, and from his hand, there are rays of light that descend, that shoot the dove down to the very level of Mary's womb. And uh, yes, now, um, so this dove has been dispatched at the level of Mary's womb. And um, the descent and Mary's response to it answer the question that she has, how can this be? Well, Luke's answer from the mouth of Gabriel is less than adequate to the physicality which the question implies the coming upon you and the overshadowing of the highest, they don't really say much about how is this going to be. They have a mystery, a majesty of mystery, but they're, they're pretty vague. And, but teachers, medieval teachers, they didn't dare ever explore how this could physically be. But an artist has to deal with the physical. So Leapy, is very keen. He finds a way to describe this. The dove, and I realize this is grainy, the dove shoots out a ray of light. And up, just opposite the dove, can you see a hole in her garment? Mm -hmm. There's a little break. And Leapy has cut a hole in her garment where the power of the Holy Spirit has broken through to her womb. Um, this is the moment of incarnation. Now, Leapy was a man of faith. He knew that Luke didn't describe it this way. This was his imagination. Still, Leapy was able to convey a truth through his split, split in her garment. This is the physical reality. He's saying this is the physical reality of the incarnation. I think this is a powerful piece. It sets our mind going. It, this was not some vague experience that she had. This was a deep reality that helped to bring Christ into the world and um, we therefore the incarnation. So this is one of many pieces that can teach the theology of the incarnation in a very imaginative way. I think you can go to the next one. 
Art um, connects us to the past and to the future. Um, the post postmodern world artists look back and in a time when we've lost our way in a time of transition, it is helpful for us to re-examine our roots. I know Bob and I are in the middle of um, choosing where we're gonna go in um, September, God willing. I'm gonna make the reservations though to England and to trace our family roots. We did part of the family one other year, but it's important. I, I wanna know, I wanna see where the families came from, but it's the same for us. We as Christians, and as a church have an enormous resource. We have a treasure trove of images that can be used to teach everything. You know, the church knew this. When Martin Luther translated the Bible into German, only 10% could read. And when Tyndale translated the Bible into English, very few could read. They had, the church had depended upon images to convey uh, theology and the scriptures. My question to us, and this even pertains to your church, by having the shows you're going to nurture something. When artist, artists and historians of the future look back and they look at 2021 or our time, will they find evidence, visual evidence? Because all of the work that you've seen before is visual evidence that Faith was alive and well at a particular point in history. And um, will there be images that record and uh, show evidence that faith was alive in our time? And the last uh, thing about art, I'm going to say, you can change it now, Zach. Art can be a restorative avenue of grace. Um, we, heard, we saw that it could be a means even of conver conversion, but it can be a wonderful uh, mediator and offering of grace to us. Our world is hurting and it needs healing. Art can be one of those restorative avenues. I'm gonna to read to you a letter. This is my crucifixion uh, piece. Uh, it is finished. Um, this is in the Vatican collection. And, um, but I would like to read a, a letter from someone who purchased this a long time ago. And she writes, my brother Warren was killed suddenly in a car accident in early July. It seems so trite to say my world collapsed, but it's the bald truth. He, I had cared for him as um, more of a mother than a sister since the first he was in, in the first uh, in the kindergarten, keeping alive, healthy, happy, educated. This was my personal mission on the planet. Virtually everything in my life from fourth grade through high school and beyond had found had been focused on him. Suddenly he was gone. And in a moment, my whole cognitive relational structure dismantled. I hung it is finished in my living room. And for the next several months, I sat and stared at Christ crucified hour after hour. It was common for me to spend entire evenings and many weekend, weekend hours as well staring at the picture. I didn't read the Bible. I couldn't study. I couldn't pray, certainly not out loud or even in coherent thought. I just sat and stared. It was only an act of, it was the only act of faith I could manage. I could hang on to Christ, even though nothing else made sense. I knew that if ever there was any hope, any possibility that this depression and sense of lostness would ever go away, it would center in him and come to me as his gift. Um, actually, I felt numb and wondered if I had any faith at all. I just sat and stared. God is faithful in my minuscule faith. All my minuscule faith could do was to focus on Christ. God still does wonders with crumbs. And he, she said, Sandra, I want you to know how much God used your art to bring me through dark nights of the soul. Reoccurring nights that for me have lasted months and years. God has used your art to focus my attention on him when nothing else could even get my attention. Meditating on Christ crucified and the implications of his grace have brought me through 
to a place of stronger and renewed faith. You can go to the last one. I realize this is all quick and very concise and, you know, um, but these, uh, this is Ruo's uh, large crucifixion, which you have. Um, and I want you to see this, but these are some of the reasons art is important and that the church knew this for centuries. We must reclaim this truth um, and find ways to enrich our spiritual encounter through the visual arts. I think you have no idea once the, the art really, it, the church is able to be open again, you have no idea how it can transform your, transform your congregation. The church that I go to is an Episcopal church in um, Chatham, Massachusetts. And um, we have had shows there now for probably close to 10 years. Um, now, Episcopalians are not known particularly for loving theology. <laughs> but I'll, I'll tell you, put me in front of the art with that congregation. They nearly levitate. To It, it, it is a place that I'm permitted to talk about these things but it's a they're educated people harvard grads etc but when they see it and experience it through the visual arts it helps to transform their faith and their lives their their visual vocabulary as a congregation is phenomenal and i'll tell you it's transformed their travel experiences too but my prayer for you is that seeing christ in the darkness that's the Ruo show that you have. Will help you focus your attention on the Lord in new ways and make this Lent a changing and exciting and deep time in your life. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. <clears throat> um, that's, it's, thank you. That's wonderful. Um, I have, 15 questions I'd love to ask, but I'm going to uh, open it up. If, uh, what questions do you have um, for Sandra related to something she said or, um, or, or in general, um, uh, what, what questions do you have? Um, and, or maybe if, while you think about that, um, I wonder too, if, if anyone um, would care to share, um, well, let's do questions for Sandra first and then I'll then, uh, I'll ask my other one. Anybody have any questions? You'll have to unmute yourself, I believe. How many uh, yeah. of you have seen any of the art? Christy has. We just opened it today for the first time, so I think mm -hmm. only a couple people have been able to. But Amelia and Christy, I heard, I heard you. I saw, saw you both about to speak. Amelia, oh, you go first. Alphabetical order. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. I was brought up uh, a Roman Catholic, and um, so there were um, a lot of images um, and uh, paintings um, in the churches that I went to. Um, and, of course, the Stations of the Cross was was something that really drew me to <laughs> to my religion. Um, what what's the history of the Episcopal Church, and um, in terms of there not being images? Um, anyway, that's just a historical question. <laughs> well, um, when you go to when you go to England, there are images. Uh, the Episcopal Church, that's the Anglican Church. The Episcopal Church is the United States. And um, there are images within it, but it has not been, in my opinion, you know, I don't know as I could speak as a real historian on this. Um, I don't think the Episcopal Church has done a lot to educate its people visually. And that may be what you feel is lacking. Um, and there needs to be concerted efforts to do that because the visual is a language. It's, it's a visual language. And you don't send somebody off to a foreign country and say, you know, you haven't even had a chance to study the language, but find your way around. 
you, you give them tools and teach them the language and it needs to be done from an earliest time. I attend a church on the Cape too called the Community of Jesus. And it has a basilica and it has art everywhere, the whole thing. Children's sermons almost every week are focused on some image in that, in that sanctuary. So they're being yeah. taught to see and to understand and being taught scripture with images. Mm -hmm. I would guess too, not that you're asking me, but I mean, the difference between um, kind of Anglicanism in England and Anglicanism in, in America, one of them is, is theologically that we're more influenced by the reform tradition in North America, which has somewhat of an allergy to representational art in church. You know, if you ever go visit your local Presbyterian church, you're just gonna see a lot of geometric shapes in the windows because they don't, they don't, they, they're too worried about idolatry. And the degree to which kind of North American Anglicanism is more greater influenced by Calvin and reform theology, I, I suspect <laughs> has something to do with the lack of motivation in training our people. Uh, with images. Christy, what was... That, you know what's changing there? Yeah. Um, I, I rent to dozens and dozens and dozens of churches all across the country. The Presbyterian church has more church galleries than any other denomination. Is that right? Yeah, so that's, but, Interesting. but I'll tell you, um, England right now, I get a write-up every week from England and I'm in contact with Ben Quash at King's College London and mm -hmm. you know a lot that's going on there. There is more going on in England in terms of art and faith than probably any other place in the world right now. It's pretty mm -hmm. exciting. I bet Ben has a lot to do with that. Yeah. Uh, Christy, what were you gonna ask? Oh. <clears throat> I'm in a room with a bunch of drums and it's very echoey. So <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you for that image from Tim Lowley, mm. whom I haven't seen before. And I'm, it made me cry and yeah. I have to learn all about him. Do you own that piece? No, it's owned by, I think the Portland Art Museum. Mm. Mm. But it's, uh, you know, I chose pieces that I, you know, of course, I don't own the Leapy one either, but I, I, I just wanted a few images that I images that I know are gripping, and can it's gripping <laughs> hone in on some import that prove what I'm trying to say. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Good job. Thank you. That's all I just wanted to say. Thanks for bringing that in. Mm. It occurs to me that. Um, the Catholic Church necessarily um, from Middle Ages onward depended on not the written word, but either the spoken word or actions, plays, or representations uh, in order to communicate the elements of faith. Um, and the reform movement happened at the same time that the Bible was being brought into national mm. languages. Right. So that there was a shift, if you will, from the image and the spoken and the action to, um, to the written word. So mm. I don't think that denatured or devalued the, uh, the, the art as, as something essential but the Bible itself and the scriptures and reading them uh, sort of gradually took a, a greater place. And I, I, I think that goes exactly with what uh, Zach was saying, that here in the new world, um, that, that shift had already taken place. Every, every settler could carry his Bible. He couldn't carry with him a uh, a representation, rare were the, were the icons. So that shift from the visual and, and action and the spoken to, to the word, in some ways, I think, uh, disadvantaged art, which is so powerful, simply because it was, was less portable. Well, that may be part of it now, but early on, the, those reformed leaders uh, were 
Well, once you get past Calvin, particularly Zwingli, other, I mean, there's a whole long list of them, were death against images. They ravaged the churches to get rid of them um, because they were, they thought that people had learned to put their faith in the image. So the baby got thrown out with the bathwater. But what we're experiencing now in the 20th and the 21st century is a, uh, especially in the Reformed Church, it's a new look. There's more confidence that we can use the image. You know, we live in an image-saturated world. Um, you know, your computer has icons on it. <laughs> it's all about the image. And um, this community of Jesus that I mentioned, they really believe that the arts are the avenue to sharing the gospel with the world in the 21st century. Yeah, and we know exactly what you mean with, with Calvin and so on. We, we lived for three years in Geneva, and it was a yeah. sh shocking experience to walk right. into the cathedral in Geneva and find it bare, yeah. absolutely bare, not, not, a, not a representation anywhere because Calvin believed yeah. that the people had to be torn away from that representation uh, and the, the worship of what he considered to be idols yeah and there were there were there were tight you know there was misuse of all that there's no question but we've gone uh, uh, 400 years or more and um it's but there's a re-examining in very profound ways all over the world as to, you know the Sadawaranabi you had he didn't have that background that told him he shouldn't do those things but he, he, somebody gave him lots of our history books because much of that work that he did reflected his knowledge of uh, various art pieces. But he came to it through his own culture. You know, he, he spoke to it out of a folk Japanese art. Ruo speaks out of his 20th century, early 20th century experience. But he had a heart, as we'll find out next week, for the dispossessed for uh, misuse, for p against power, you know, et cetera. So each artist, each time. Um, now the church never recognized Ruo. He only had one church that ever had a piece of his artwork. And that was a stained glass window that's in the church at a sea. Um, I think there's two stained glass windows. So he was never appreciated by the church because he was critical of the church. Mm. Mm. It's just great. What else is out there? I see several of your minds turning. Mm -hmm. Well, as next week we will look at Ruo's work more. I'll I'll share yeah. with you how I started collecting his work. Um, we're friends with the family of Rouault. We've been invited to their home in Southern France and in Paris. Um, their, their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren are carrying on his legacy by seeing that his work is all over the world. They're very aware even that your church has a show right now. Mm, that's lovely. I wonder, I wonder if we might end by, um, if a few folks might be willing to share, um, the ways in which visual art has been important in your life devotionally, um, if if any kind of visual art is uh, any part of your own devotional habits, or or perhaps there's a particular memory of Saint Francis um, with the Damiano cross kind of experience that you had uh, somewhere along the way that's been a anchor for you in your in your journey. Would anybody? Uh, care to share. Yeah, Jay, go ahead. I think one of the most um, spiritual places that I've ever experienced in my life was um, St. Peter's in New York City, um, there with the chapel that Louise Nevelson did. I knew Louise Nevelson, and I was actually an assistant for her um, in the early 80s, and um, it was just amazing. The absolute peace that those abstract pieces formed 
but yet the power of the spirit was there. You could feel the Holy Spirit breathing in the, in the works that she did there. And the altarpiece behind that was just incredibly heavy. The simplicity of the cross that she made was just Im immeasurable. She was truly a voice, you know, of, and I think so many of the visual artists, Ruro, um, I'm even thinking of, of um, somebody like um, some, several of the German expressionists yeah. who used Christ, you know, in so many things, um, really is speaking through the spirit. You know, the artists are speaking through the spirit, no matter, even if it's abstraction, many times it can convey that beauty and that depth of the Holy Spirit with it. Mm. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, Father, um, uh, your that was a Lutheran church, right? Saint yes, Peter? it is a Lutheran church. Yes, and Peterson. Mm -hmm. Did you you knew him, the pastor there? I did not know him. I knew Nevelson, the artist. Okay, Nevelson. But Peterson was the pastor who instigated or yeah. it made all the contacts for that. He is a dear friend. Oh, really? Yeah. And so that so you know um, the Kooning did, the, did yeah. the cryptic back behind the major yeah. in the big place. Yeah, yeah. And he is still living. Oh, is he? Wow, mm -hmm. amazing, amazing. Because none of those artists are. Yeah. Who else has uh, experiences or, or uh, memories? Or... I, Katie, go ahead. So I had this wonderful experience. Actually, um, there is a church uh, that is right above uh, Chartreuse in France. Um, where there is this uh, 20th century artist uh, where he's shown his work uh, in a chapel there. I had an opportunity to visit it um, with a bunch of my colleagues. I'm an engineer, uh, none of which were Christian. And this whole chapel is full of at least, I want to say at least 50 to 100 of these liturgical paintings. Um, mm. And it was such an incredible opportunity to walk into this space and to experiencing the painting with my friends that were, you know, Hindi and, and Muslim and, and just um, what it, it just gave a completely different avenue to share this message and gospel that it was something that was so electrifying. It was something that everybody walked out, you know, with, with, something that just really grasped them. Um, and it showed me for the first time what a tool art can be in sharing just what we love with other people in a new way. Yeah. And what a uh, evangelistic tool it can be. I mean, there's something, it's, there's the, the barrier to entry, the wall to entry, well, I don't know what the phrase I'm looking for is it a different, there's a different crowd of people that you can have a conversation with if you can get them in the room with a Chagall piece, you know, then, then, then you could, um, if you're just walking up and down the street and they say, and you have, have try to have a conversation with someone about being a Christian, you know. Uh, yeah. It yeah. opens a lot of doors that couldn't be opened otherwise. <laughs> That's, That's a better way of saying it. Mm. Right. Well, we've got a couple more minutes. I'd love to hear a few more. Well, you know what, I would, I would encourage you all to get to the church this week. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes, please do. Please do. Amelia, were you going to share? Well, I, I, just, mean, um, I just wanted to say that I went to um, uh, a sissy with my brother um, and sister. Um, and um, the, exper the experience that I felt in walking through that church, um, my, our family had always had a devotion to St. Francis because my mother was born on the feast of St. Francis. And so we had St. Francis statues everywhere in our house mm. and in our gardens, um, which a lot of people have a wonderful devotion to him. But the paintings of Giotto um, telling the whole story of St. Oh, Francis I know. and also this, uh, the, uh, the Church of Santa Chiara um, are just, overwhelmed me um and you know we were only there for two two days and spent one day um 
touring the, the churches, both of those churches, mm -hmm. um, but it was just quite, quite a beautiful spiritual experience. You know, um, I was in the, it was in the large church the, where the Jottos are. Yes. And I was there, it must have been 97. I was there in the fall. That December or January, the earthquake came and took down the ceiling. Oh. And I had fabulous photos of that ceiling. <laughs> but it's been put together in a marvelous way that you'd hardly know. It's, it's amazing. Mm. That is a fabulous town. Bill, are you going to say something? Yeah, yeah I was going to say something. I can't remember the name of the artist, I'm afraid, but right here in Austin, we have a very spiritual building. It's just simply called Austin, and it's on the campus of the University of Texas. And if you walk in there, it is very, I mean, he didn't Ellsworth have to be, pardon? Ellsworth Kelly. That's it. Ellsworth oh, Kelly. I've it, met him. It is a beautiful building, and it, it, you know, he doesn't claim to be a Christian artist per se, but there's a stele in there uh, at the place of the altar. There are uh, uh, sculptures, I guess we'd have to call them, around the uh, walls that reflect the, uh, the, the stations of the cross, mm. you know, 14 of them. And mm. they're very, very moving, as is the stained glass. So even though it's not it's a secular chapel, if you will. It is deeply permeated with Christian meaning. And mm. if you haven't That's seen it. it, you need to go see it. Well, I'm coming. I'm yeah. co I will be in Austin the first weekend in um, November. It's going to be the Christians in the Visual Arts Conference is in Austin. Well, um, by all means, go to that chapel. I don't know if chapel is not the right word. They just call it simply Austin. It's his last sculpture. Okay. Last work of art, but mm -hmm. it is, it's just overwhelmingly beautiful. In its I, there's a similar uh, experience available in with the Rothko Chapel in yeah. Houston. Yeah. Same thing. This uh, time, this is more, space. More, this is more meaningful. Mm. I mean, I wonder if that has. I think Bill, that's that's helped. That helps me. I wonder. I wonder if that helps us understand the way in which art can be a helpful evangelistic tool because we know lots of artists who made this art actually really struggled with their faith themselves you know like that it's this is a I mean I think the rule that we have is a great example of that like there's um I was reading the book Sandra that you sent the the uh, the what's it Bill Durness the book he talks about in the beginning of that book the distinction in Christian art between kind of church art and religious art um church art being that which is didactic in function you know here is something here's a stained glass window of the Annunciation meant to teach you the basic parts of the story of the Annunciation and then there's religious art which is like people processing their own journeys of faith and discipleship by doing the art you know and and that is in that latter category is very much the art that's now hanging on our walls you know this is somebody who is trying to work out their own salvation on the canvas mm -hmm. and because we know that lots of artists you know i mean like and artists who who themselves are very nervous about claiming any kind of Christian or religious identity, but who are kind of flirting with religious themes. That's a inherently kind of accessible and humble starting place that a much wider variety of people feel permission to, to enter into and wonder alongside, you know, I mean, I, that your comment was just helpful in, in me kind of getting there, Bill. So I just want to hold that up. Um, any final thoughts or Sandra, we'll, we'll, we'll talk, we'll talk to you again next week, but any, any closing questions or, or thoughts? I'd just like to say thank you to Sandra for her very uh, wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed it and uh, glad she joined us and hope, looking forward to next week. And your generosity in sharing it with us. Thank you so very much. Yeah. Well, we'll do a little bit more Ruo next week. And I'm pretty passionate about him. <laughs> <laughs>
Good. You know, well, he's really... not, he, he, the other artists that we have, we have a lot of the uh, Watanabe. We have a large collection of Chagall's. And, um, and somebody mentioned German Expressionists. Um, two years ago, we launched an exhibition called uh, Was God Dead? Biblical Imagination and German Expressionist Art. And that show was to flesh out how come in a time when God was dead, Nietzsche's, they were all living under Nietzsche's thinking and absorbing it. How come, why did so many of them do so many powerful biblical images? Mm -hmm. So Yeah, that's great. That's awesome. I can't wait to talk about that. Um, great. Well, this is fantastic. Um, I really look forward to continuing this conversation. Thank you so much for being with okay. us, Sandra. What a, what a gift uh, to us. Um, and uh, many blessings to all. And we'll see you. We'll see you next week. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye now.